it's important. Um, so let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 3, <clears throat> title of our study today, These Present Afflictions. 1 Thessalonians 3, These Present Afflictions. One of the things we saw in our introductory study to 1 Thessalonians is that every chapter will focus at some point, usually near the end or at the end, on the coming of our Lord, the return of our Lord for us or the return of our Lord with us. But but he is fully focused on the reality of the second coming. We're going to see that carry on in the chapter today and chapters four and five. And when we get into second Thessalonians, he's all about the things that will proceed. And we'll see this next time, too, that will proceed his coming, the times, the seasons, the things we'll see happening to tell us, hey, we're getting close to the coming of our Lord. So um, for today, I've titled this study, These Present Afflictions. Because, well, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. The words affliction and tribulation, they come from the same Greek word, and they're used interchangeably. But he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, in Romans 8, 18, says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which which will be revealed in us. I'm giving you a few of these to kind of lay a foundation. Short chapter, we'll dig into the nuggets that are here for us. But but important to know, trials and tribulations are promised to us. But Jesus has overcome and will be able to do the same. So he says, the sufferings we're enduring... And, and I would assume that most of you, if not all of you, if you haven't recently or you may soon, you suffer some. And for many different reasons, which we'll see fleshed out in the study itself. But, but again, it's not to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Peter tells us that trials, well, they prove our faith is genuine. James tells us that they produce patience and and maturity, and we need both. Don't remember where I heard it, but I never forgot it. A faith that can't be tested is a faith that can't be trusted. So the tests, the trials, the tribulations, the persecutions, all of those test our faith. Are we for real? Do we really believe that the Lord is good? that everything he allows into our lives, he will use for good. Well, Psalm, let's see where, Psalm 34, round 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them. So um, those are sort of foundational. Now, a couple people to consider. John the Baptist. Many of you are aware of his story. And we're getting uh, nearer to the birth of Christ. And, and of course, John was a cousin of Jesus. They grew up. They knew each other. They hung out. And, uh, but John was called as the forerunner of Jesus. And, and and so he was the one who identified Jesus having been, been, having been, been, having been given. So I, I just make up new words whenever I'm starting to stumble like that. Having been, you feel free to use it. Um, but having been in that place where, where well, he identifies Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was chosen, he was faithful, he was fruitful, he was a little odd, but he was God's guy for that job. But John ends up being arrested. And during the time in which he was incarcerated, he sent 
messengers, some of his disciples who were still following him, to Jesus to say, are you the coming one or should we look for another? It turns out that when we're stressed, when we're tried, when we're in the midst of a trial and certainly imprisonment would, you know, that would qualify, well, we can begin to have doubts. And so it's so important that, that, that we see even John, who was as together as you could be, as strong a believer as you could possibly be, he still sometimes had his doubts. Are you the coming one? Or, or, or do we look for another? Jesus answers those who were sent. And it is possible, and I should say it, I will say it, that, that John just wanted his disciples to connect with Jesus. Maybe he could see the writing on the wall and he's like, I'm not going to get out of here alive. And, and, and by the way, he was in there for just using one word to people who didn't like it. The word repent, turn it around, stop thinking the way you're thinking, start thinking the way God wants you to, stop living the way you're living, live the way God wants you to. Well, he said it one too many times and he said it to Herod, who I don't think was that offended by it, but his wife, yeah, she was not about that at all. And ultimately it will cost John his head, but, but get this, he was faithful to tell everyone in every circumstance that they needed to repent. And he was paving the way for the coming of the Lord. Prepare yourself for the coming of the Lord. And so here's what Jesus says. Go tell John what you see and hear. The blind see, the lame leap, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the poor have the gospel preached to them. All of those signs, by the way, prophesied in the Old Testament, which John knew well, and what certainly Jesus grew up and knew him. And, and, and those disciples should have known too. But he says, go, go, go tell them this. And, and so Paul writes this particular letter and this particular chapter with, with those kinds of thoughts in mind, he wants to ensure neither his suffering, and it was great, nor their suffering would stumble them. And I want to say that's God's heart for each of us. When we suffer and we will, when we're tried and we will be, the enemy just comes full attack. Sometimes it's aggressive and and sometimes it's more passive, but, but whether he comes as a roaring lion or a, or a subtle serpent, the goal of the enemy is always the same. And that's to disqualify us, to get us to disobey our Lord and disqualify us for fellowship or service. Now that will never be permanent once you're his, but, but that's what it means to be defiled, rendered unfit for worship, unfit for service, unfit for fellowship. So Paul, with that in mind, take a look at chapter uh, 3 here, verse 1. Therefore, he says, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. The key words in this section are words that are associated with one another. He says he wants to establish and encourage. To establish means to firm up or strengthen them in their confidence in the Lord and commitment to the Lord. To encourage means to bring comfort. So he wants to do both. That's his heart. That's his plan. Make sure they know they're on solid ground. Remind them that they're standing on the rock of their salvation and then comfort them. 
And when he writes to the Corinthian church, and we studied those letters not that long ago, in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. It's not just a reminder that God is there for us. He goes on to answer a question many have asked me. Why does God let me go through that when he could just heal me of it or deal with it or protect me from it? The answers in that very same passage, and, and I want you to have it so you look it up later and know this is, in fact, what it's saying. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, he goes on to say, God who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He says, when we're in the midst of those trials, when we're in the midst of those tribulations, when we're going through it, well, just know that the comfort you're receiving from the Lord, he wants you to pass that on to those who are going through a similar season. Well, he uses a couple other words that are so important in the context of this passage, afflictions and tribulations. I think I already made mention of the fact that they are the same Greek word. It's translated five times, not one of those. Afflictions is 18 of the 45 times it appears in scripture. Tribulation is 22 of those uh, 45 times. So afflictions and tribulations, you can use them interchangeably because he does and he is. Matthew 13, the very first time that word tribulation appears, it's in the context of the parable of the sower. And he talked about the, the seed that's sown. And I won't walk you through the whole parable, just the part that applies to this given situation. The seed that's sown and almost takes root. It's received with joy. So, so they hear the truth. And perhaps this is your experience. You've heard the truth. You're so excited about it, but now you're starting to have doubts and you're starting to wane in your commitment to the one who so committed himself to you. He went to the cross, died for your sins, was buried and rose again. So, so this is the one who, who receives the word on stony places and, and he hears the word, receives it with joy, but he has no root in himself. He never gets rooted. And what? In the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Because, because our, our life is, is entirely wrapped up in the, the reality that everything that touches us comes through him. Nothing can happen to you that he doesn't allow. And if you're like, well, really bad stuff has happened to me. Hey, join the club. Really bad stuff has happened to many of us. But that doesn't mean God didn't love us or wasn't there for us or wasn't watching over us. It's how we respond to the things that happen in our lives that determines the fruitfulness of our lives. So many hear the word and they're like, this is awesome, forgiveness of sin and everything's good. And, but when trial or persecution, he says, tribulation or persecution arises because of the word. Because of the word? Yeah, because the word says as a believer, there are things just we shouldn't be doing. And there are things the word says as a believer we should be doing. And when the persecution comes specifically because you're trying to be faithful to the word or share it with people you love who you know need it, they need to hear it. Even the good news of the gospel, do you know not everybody's happy to hear that they're sinners and on their way to a Christless eternity in a real place called hell where I personally believe the greatest torment, because he never says torture, he says torment, that's mental, it's emotional, it's, it's internal. The, the greatest torment of that day, that, that everlasting reality, will be these two things, that you will be alone. Now, I, I'm hoping, I'm not really talking to somebody who's on their way to hell, but just in case you realize, hey, he's talking about me. It doesn't have to be that way. See, see, that's the thing. I believe hell is going to be the loneliest places 
ever. Back in the, you know, Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne and all those, are, oh, I just want to die and, you know, go to hell and be with my friends. What if there's no party? What if you're just isolated and alone forever? That would be torment, you see. And then the other thing is that, that it's a place where people will know it didn't have to be this way. Because nobody ends up in hell just because God didn't love them or choose them or send someone to share with them. People can only end up there by walking over the cross and rejecting what God did there for them and for us. Well, anyway, this one receives the word, excited about it, sharing with other people, and then tribulation comes, persecution comes. People don't want to hear what you think now or believe now or how what they're, the way they're living is, is going to end in devastation. And, and so this is important because it explains why some who've walked away are so bitter toward God because that thing happened that they weren't expecting. And I can't even imagine, not capable of imagining how much more complicated this is and difficult it is in the age of social media. Because it used to be if people hated you, they had to go to great lengths to let you know. You know, they could call you on the phone, but you didn't have to answer. And they could write you a letter, but you didn't have to read it. But now they can just post stuff about you and say stuff that's so harsh and unloving toward you and concerning you. Anyway, some are, are, are bitter toward God and have walked away from God simply because nobody told them, hey, it's not going to be an easy road. It's a narrow and difficult road that leads to everlasting life and few find it. Those are the words of our Lord. There was a guy named Job. Some of you are familiar with him and his story. He was wealthy. He was popular. He had a big family. Everything was going good. God gets in a conversation with Satan and, and says, have you considered my servant Job, a just and upright man who eschews evil and does righteousness? And Satan starts saying, yeah, well, you bless him. You take away that hand of protection and let me at him. He'll curse you to your face. Well, of course, God knew Job wouldn't do that. And so he actually allows Satan to, to take from Job. What does he take? He takes his health. He takes his wealth. He takes his family. He takes his livelihood. He, Satan is a taker. God's, God's a giver. But Satan just takes from. And he's all about, you know, making people miserable and making people bitter. But in any case, he lost his reputation. He lost his friends. They came and there's a word of encouragement in this little part. When somebody's really suffering and they've suffered great loss and you know it, don't be afraid to go and comfort them, but be aware that probably anything you say won't be a great comfort. These guys did it right for a whole week. They just came and they looked at Job and his suffering and what he was going through. And they just sat silently with him. There's power in that because just the power of presence showing up saying, hey, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. That's all you got to say. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. And so the, the good news is just being there brought comfort to him for an entire week. But then they took turns explaining to Job how God doesn't afflict the righteous. Of course, they hadn't read the book of Job. And they didn't probably remember Joseph was afflicted, hated by his brethren sold a slave and, and, and he just went through all these things. Why? Because his father loved him most because he was the father's favorite and because he had dreams and in his dreams, all his brothers bowed down to him and kind of you know, had to do that thing. And they didn't like that at all. 
So they, they sell him into slavery. He ends up going through just a nightmare of experiences. And then, well, God raises him up to second in command in the whole place. And during that season, his brothers come. And interestingly enough, they bow down before him. He doesn't look like them anymore. He walks like an Egyptian and talks like an Egyptian and dresses like an Egyptian. He had that whole thing going, you know. And so they don't know who he is, but he knows who they are. And he, and he toys with them just a little, which I fully get and even approve. Not that it matters, but, but they deserve so much worse. At the end of everything, after the death of their father, fearing that he would take their lives or finally pay them back because he wasn't going to do it with dad still alive, they came and they just, they, they begged for forgiveness. And dad wanted you to, you know, forgive us. And, and he said, hey, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. He sent me ahead of you to save many souls alive. He was able to endure great suffering, Real tribulation, real trials, and not for a week or a day or a month, but for a big part of his life. And yet he was able to forgive his brothers. And see, unforgiveness, it's one of those things. It's one of the worst things we can be guilty of because it doesn't actually hurt the person you won't forgive. It hurts you. That bitterness, that, that unwillingness, to just say, God, give me your heart for them. They, they couldn't, like, you know, they couldn't have understood how painful this would be for me. And, and so all of that to say, there are those who've walked away and there are those of us who've suffered greatly and will suffer again in the future. But, but this whole thing was about showing Satan that Job was truly a righteous man. That's just crazy. And Joseph, again, already mentioned him. All that he went through was to preserve the family and the whole Egyptian population that had survived up to that point by the wisdom God gave him in dealing with upcoming famines and such. Jesus, we're told, because we always have to end up with him, right? Jesus came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to these he gave power to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. But there's something else. Jesus, too, was the beloved of the Father. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And he was rejected and falsely accused and, and condemned and crucified. And listen, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. That's what Jesus saw. He saw, okay, this suffering's real. This pain is real. All of this is the joy set before him. And what's that joy? You in his presence at his coming again. You with him for eternity. You believing in him and living for him even now. But in greater measure as the, the, the times go on. Hebrews 11 gives us a record of Old Testament saints who walked and lived by faith. They were all tried. They were all tested. They were all tempted. And, and he gives us a short list, and, and then we'll be all the way down to verse 5 and back in our text in a moment. But uh, he gives us a short list of, of heroes of the faith in verses oh, 32 toward, down toward 40. But, but he speaks of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith, because these are heroes of the faith, they're like superheroes of the Old Testament though, truly. They through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, Stop the mouth of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword out of weakness, were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. 
Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Have to pause on those and then I have just a couple more verses related here. Listen, when we read that some had their, their, their loved ones, women received their dead, raised to life again. It just sounds like, yeah, they experienced that, that, that thing that, that Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, got to experience, that the widow of Nain's, um, you know, son, and, 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 and then the, the, the little daughter, the Jairus' only daughter, they all got to experience that resurrection. It didn't make... And by the way, it was, a, it was a not the same kind of resurrection we'll experience because they actually could have and would have eventually died again. They were raised from the dead, but it's less than the resurrection that we'll experience because that's forevermore. But get this, in the midst of all of that, if you were to tell the widow, hey, don't worry, he's going to raise your, your husband again. How comforting would that be if she just lost her husband or her child? Or, or it, it, the, the point is the suffering they endured was real and severe. They had no idea they were going to see their loved ones again. They might have known the Old Testament promises of resurrection because they were students of scripture. But all of that to say this, that, that these received the, their loved ones back. Others were tortured that they might obtain a better resurrection. And, and then, and then the, the sort of the climax is that section, verse 37 of Hebrews 11. Make a mental note, check it out. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. You might think, if you'd been there and you were one of them, that God was upset with you. For some reason, he isn't protecting you. For some reason, he's allowing these things into your life. But get this. Here's God's estimation of them. It's in verse 38 of Hebrews 11, after saying they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, slain with the sword, wandered about, destitute, afflicted, torment, tormented, he says, of whom the world was not worthy. He's just saying, listen, God was well pleased with them. These things happened to them because they were faithful to him. Jesus told the 12, the hour is coming and now is when you'll be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the father is with me. These things I've spoken unto you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Listen. It's true for you. It's true for me. When I read lists like that, I'm just grateful. I mean, the things that I've suffered compared to any of that, I'm like, Lord, thank you for just protecting me from worse and protecting me from being one that walked away from you or accused you or, or stopped trusting in you just because hard stuff happened in my life. So the hour's coming. That, that they'd be scattered. But, but he says, listen, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Well, back here in our chapter, in verse 5, see, we're already to verse 5. There's hope for an early uh, ending, uh, maybe. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. He knows he shared the truth with them and he could see that they believed it. But he knows, as I already shared, the enemy's sly. He can intimidate powerfully or he can come stealthily. And either way, his goal is to wipe us out, to do us in, to make us. Well, he knows he can never have us, so he just wants to make us 
impotent spiritually. He wants to make us unfaithful or he wants to make accusers of us as he's an accuser of the brethren. Well, again, God allows these things, such things, to prove we're for real. We're genuine as we choose to obey his word, to yield to and walk in his spirit, we defeat our enemy. Success isn't avoiding the trials and temptations and persecutions and such of life. It's simply, you know, passing the test. Success is just passing the test. It's only a test. And there'll always be a testimony. And so many of us, are acquainted with what happens when we don't pass the test, sadly. We fail, we falter, there's shame and separation because sin always separates us. There's fear and frustration, depression and despair, but there's always a way back. What does he call us to? Confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, forgive me for thinking like that, for, for feeling that way, for speaking like that, or failing to speak when I know you were calling me to do it. Whatever it is, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of them. But then there's more. To confess leads to repentance. Because confession without repentance, that's just like, okay, you got me, I'm busted, I did it or I didn't do it, or I didn't do it the way you wanted me to do it, I can say, okay, I, I did it, and not have really confessed, because to confess biblically means to say what God says about it. Not just that sin is bad, or sin is evil, or sin is wicked, but that, that the wages of sin is death. Lord, I've separated myself in relationships because of my own sin, my own response to how people have treated me or things they've said about me. God, forgive me that. That's real confession. And repentance, it is the proof you've actually <laughs> confessed that, that there's visible transformation. There are better choices, a better lifestyle, more care for God's plan and less for our complaints. Well, verse 6, Paul shares in verses 6 and 10, by the way, 6 through 10, his comfort and joy. And remember, he's in the midst of, of a incarceration. He, he visited a lot of jails in his ministry. And it wasn't like, you know, jail ministry. At least I don't think that's what he planned. But we used to go Buddy Daryl Mansfield and I, he would come to town. We'd do a concert downtown. Then we'd go play in juvie and we'd go to the jail if we could get in. Juvie was always easier to get in than jail for some reason. And, uh, but, but Paul, he's not visiting to do a concert and share Jesus. He's, he's there, you know, as a prisoner. And it's so important because when you listen to him, knowing that, it just makes you think, wow, that's, that's how I want to be, Lord. Whatever comes. He says in verse 6, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, and we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you, by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Listen, nothing has changed in Paul's circumstance. He just sent and got word that they were doing well. And he says, that's living. Hey, I'm living it up now. And I'm thinking, man, how far I am from that mindset that doesn't matter what's happening to me. It only matters how I respond to it and what I'm thinking about in the midst of it. Well, Paul's accusers said his suffering was the result of his sin. It happens, but we, like Paul, will often suffer for Jesus and in Jesus because, well, he said if they hate me, if they hate you, know they hated me first. 
and they hated me worse. He doesn't say that, but I like to, you know, do that alliteration, worse and hearst. <laughs> hearst, another new word. You can use it. Um, they hated me first. So, so God had given, by the way, to the Apostle Paul specific prophetic words. He gave them to Ananias, who after Saul, who hated Jesus and was persecuting Christians, even to the death, met Jesus on the Damascus Road. He, 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 he sent this guy, Ananias, who said, whoa, Lord. No, he said, I want you to go and I want you to, you know, welcome this guy to the family, lay hands on him, pray for him. And he's like, whoa, that is not going to happen. And then he says, do you even know what he's been doing? You ever have a conversation like that with the Lord? Have you heard what he's like or she's like? Have you met my boss? You know, listen, God knows everything. And here's what happens. It's Acts 9, uh, 9.15 or 8.15. He, he, Ananias said no, but God said Go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer, listen, for my name's sake. Paul knew he was going to suffer. And God wasn't punishing him for the guy he was before he gave his life to the Lord. People were persecuting him because of the life he lived once he came to the Lord. That's why we read in places like 1 Peter 3.17, it's better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Hey, that's Paul. 1 Peter 4.15, he says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. 1 Peter 4.19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him and doing good as to a faithful creator. Well, Paul continues here then in verse 9 and 10. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sakes before our God. Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. It's worth reminding us that, that Paul is dictating these letters when he's in prison. Why? He's chained to a Roman soldier. It's hard to write. And, and, and so he'll say, he'll say, see, look, it's my handwriting. I write with the great big letters, you know. That's because that's all he could do. But he dictated the letters and they got down exactly what he wanted to say. And, and so He's just saying, I, I can't wait to, to be with you. I, I, I'm just thanking God for you. And, and I'm praying that I will see you face to face. And that I can perfect what is lacking in your faith. That word perfect, it, it means to complete. It, it's used in various ways. It's used of mending nets perfects the net. It returns it to its usefulness. It's used of, of healing a heart that perfects that person so that the, the bitterness or the anger or the, the, the whatever it might be that isn't like Jesus, that, that that is dealt with and put away, making us fit for the work he's called us to. So, he goes on to continue, <laughs> goes on to continue. Yeah, there's a phrase we needed. Um, and, and, and verses 11 through 13, he does something I mentioned he does in every chapter in 1 Thessalonians. And that is, as he prays for them, he, he reminds them that their confidence has got to be in the Lord. And, and it reads like a benediction. He'll have an actual benediction at the end of chapter five, but this sounds like one. It almost sounds like he was getting done. And, and he was with these thoughts. Maybe if you're newer to this, you, you haven't been made aware that that this these letters were that they were a letter there were no chapters there were no verses he just read wrote wrote letters and sent them 
and people read them. So that it's easier for us. I'm glad that they added, you know, verse 9 and verse 10 and chapter 3 because it'd be a lot harder to find our place if I just said, hey, let's go to that place where Paul says this. We'd be like here forever, just looking through and never finding it unless you really knew him or, or that, you know, his writing. So in any case, he says in verse 11, it's, it's his prayer for them and his confidence, not in them, but in the Lord. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. I mentioned every chapter ends with a promise of his coming. Let me read you the first and the second, and then we'll read the third, and I'll give you three words to dwell on and hopefully amen. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Chapter 2, verse 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. Chapter 3, 12 and 13, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to just as we do you and to all just as we do you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Before I share my three words and I'll get you to say them with me because that's the prayer of my heart and it should be of yours. If you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, let me assure you, heaven is real and hell is real. That, that they're, they're, we are on one road or the other. And the, and the life you've chosen, the, the one you're serving, if it's Jesus, the, the ultimate destination, not the end of your usefulness or fruitfulness, because we will serve him for eternity. In what capacity? I don't have that figured out. He says some things here and there, and we might get into them at some point. But we will be serving him forever, and we will be with him forever. And so you're going to either be with him and serving him, or you're going to be separated from him with no hope of ever being reconciled to him. But today there's hope. There's forgiveness. There's, there's an offer on the table. Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. He offers you forgiveness and transformation. He who begins the good work will be faithful to complete it. So no thought of, well, I don't know if I can do it should enter your mind. If that is your thought, you don't have to do it. You just have to let him have his way. He does the work. Our pattern is to hear and resist, to hear and to run, to hear and rebel. That's, that's normal response, normal pattern for many. But, but listen, once you come to the Lord, you end up running to him, not from him. You, you end up serving him, not self. You end up living for the one who died for your sins, was buried and rose again. If you need to give your life to Jesus today, if you understood to confess is to say what God says about it, the wages of sin is death. That means separation. And every time we sin relationally with anyone in our life, there's a, there's a break. It's, it's not death physically, it's, but that comes later, but, but it's, it, it's a break in, in the relationship. And that can only be repaired by confession and, and asking for forgiveness from the person you have actually hurt and wounded. And, and, and so, but he forgives us. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us 
of all unrighteousness. So you have to confess that you're guilty and he's holy. And you have to confess Jesus is Lord. And then you have to repent. And you don't have to promise God I'll never do those things again. You just have to say, God, I I repent of them. I ask your forgiveness for them. And I'm going to rely on you to give me power over them. Because far too many people make the promise they can never keep. And then they're just beat up by the enemy again. So, no, he'll begin the good work. You just have to let him have you and have his way. Anyone this hour, if you want to pray and give your life to the Lord Jesus, if you've never done it, I'd ask you to raise your hand, to hold an eye. Allow me the great privilege and, and the joy of introducing you to the one who, by whom you were created and for whom you were created. From separated from him because of your own sin, not the things that happened to you or things beyond your control, your own choices, your own responses, your own decisions. Anyone this hour, if you need to say, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin, I'd ask you to do two things. Raise your hand and catch my eye. So I know you're not just stretching. You're you're saying, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to the one who gave his life for me. Anyone this hour. Anyone this service, listen, in the overflow, in the cafe, logged on or listening in, you can square up with the Lord today. You can confess you're guilty and ask for his forgiveness. You can ask his strength to overcome the things that have taken you down and done you in. And you do that, he will be faithful to do all that. I'm so grateful for it in Jesus' name. Listen, I had three words. I told you we'll conclude with these. And they're simply, Lord, come quickly. And I mean it. It's like, it's not that I'm afraid of how will we get through the next season or the next this or the next that. I just want to see the Lord. And if he's leaving us here, he's leaving us here on purpose and with purpose. But it's totally fine to say, Lord, come quickly quickly. And if you want to say that with me, I'm going to say it two more times. I invite you to say the same. Lord, come quickly. One more time. Lord, come quickly. Our heart, Lord, our desire is to see you face to face, to hear those words, well done, and enter in. And and Lord, to know that, that all these things you've told us, well, They're all leading to your very throne in heaven. Cleansed, forgiven, forgot, sin forgotten, washed away. All that's present, Lord, but we will be perfected in your presence. And because of that, we say, Lord, come quickly. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Let's stand for a last song together.